John 21. We'll read from verse 18. Last time we saw Peter's restoration. And now we read the conclusion of this chapter. John 21 from verse 18. Verily, verily, I say to thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest where thou desirest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and bring thee where thou dost not desire. But he said this, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And having said this, he says to him, Follow me. Peter, turning around, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also leaned at supper on his breast, and said, Lord, who is it that delivers thee up? Peter, seeing him, says to Jesus, Lord, and what of this man? Jesus says to him, If I will that he abide until I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. This word therefore went out among the brethren, that the disciple does not die. And Jesus did not say to him, he does not die, but if I will that he abide until I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple who bears witness concerning these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his witness is true. And there also are many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself would contain the books written. So far the reading of the scriptures. What we have today is really the conclusion of this wonderful gospel, where we have the presentation of the Son of God, who is the beloved of the Father. We have seen that He is really connected with three things, life, light, and love. And these three themes go throughout the whole book. We've also seen how He is the great I Am. And this is the person who is presented in this book, who is also our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Beloved. And so this book is, that's why I said this book is a theme that will continue to be before us forever and ever. Now, when we started chapter 21, we saw there is a special way that this book is divided. We've seen that during the life of the Lord Jesus, during His ministry, there were seven great miracles. And we have seen then that His resurrection, of course, is the greatest miracle of all. But then we have seen in chapter 21, the miracle connected with a picture of the world to come, of the millennium. And it's interesting that what happened, it happened in Galilee. So there is a connection with chapter 2, where we have the first sign of the Lord Jesus, one of those seven signs during his life, where we have seen the water uh, changed into wine. And that is the a picture of the joy of the millennium. And what we have seen in the beginning of chapter 21, with this wonderful catch of fish, it's also a picture of the millennium and how uh, the Lord Jesus will be the very center of this world to come and how His people will be connected with Him. And then we have seen from verse 15 the uh, restoration of Peter. And we, we see that that's a very important theme also for us today. You know, this Peter, he was a wonderful instrument in the hands of God, but there was much of Peter himself. When he said to the Lord, Lord, even if all will uh, forsake you, I will not forsake you. I will even die for you. And then he said it in his own strength, confidence in himself. And then the Lord showed him, you can see it in Luke 22 also, that that do, would not work. But what we have read today, we see that the Lord Jesus takes that theme and Yes, if you want to die for us, you will die for me. Uh, if you want to die for me, you will die for me, in verse 18. So we'll come to that in a, in a moment. But this theme that Peter had to learn not to put trust in himself, 
was, the, was then addressed by the Lord in those three questions. Those three questions that we saw the last time, um, do you love me, uh, is really uh, the Lord's work to restore Peter and also to uh, teach him not to have trust in himself. And in that condition, having no trust in himself but putting all trust in the Lord, now the Lord could use him and now the Lord could tell him what was going to happen. So in verse 18, verily, verily, we have 25 times in John's Gospel, Amen, Amen, verily, verily, so 50 times the word is found. And that is a confirmation. The Lord speaks here as the great I am. And this is the last time that he uses this expression, verily, verily. I say to you, when you were young, you could gird yourself and walk where you desired. That was Peter in his own strength. But when you shall be old, you shall stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird you and bring you where you do not desire. So that was the indication that the Lord gave you, yes Peter, you have said you want to die for me, it will happen and that will be uh, under my control but not under your control. And I want to connect this with a verse in Second Peter. In Second Peter, just before Peter passed away from this scene, he died a martyr's death, Peter wrote this epistle that's closely connected with his first epistle of course that he wrote to Hebrew Christians in the first, but also for all believers, of course. And in 2 Peter 1, he speaks about what was going to happen to him. 2 Peter 1, 14. And by the way, before I forget, that's the only thing that had to take place before the rapture. So let's read that first. 2 Peter 1, verse 14. Knowing... Okay, let's start at verse 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, or this tent, that means in his human body that he had, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So what the Lord says here in John 21, was the Lord showing him how Peter would die, and that Peter would die for the Lord. And that's the only prophecy that needed to be fulfilled before the rapture can take place. Now Peter has died, he's now in paradise, so the rapture can take place any time, any moment. That's of course taught in other scriptures, but my point is, there is no other prophecy that stands in the way for the fulfillment of that blessed hope that the Lord will come himself to take us away from this scene. And our brother in his prayer at the end of the first meeting referred to that. The coming of the Lord Jesus is imminent. And so what Peter's exercise was, he was going to pass from this scene, he would die for the Lord, and then he wanted the believers who would be there, the next generation and then the following generation, until the Lord will come, he wanted them to be strong, to strengthen themselves in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. Not to strengthen themselves in his own strength, in their own strength, like Peter first thought he could do, but to strengthen ourselves in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. That's the theme in First and Second Peter. All the resources we have are in the Lord Jesus. And that's the only way that we can grow in Him. And that's for all of us, young people, older ones, for the very old ones, we need to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Peter says in verse 13 that he wants to stir us up. He wants to encourage us to remember these words so that we are not without resources. Peter shows that the resources that he had in, first, in 2 Peter 1 are the same resources that we have today. That will be a study in itself. But I want to encourage you to study 2 Peter in this context that everything we need to survive we have in the Lord Jesus. These are the resources we have. We don't need a hierarchy of man-made rulers. We don't need a Pope. We need the Lord Jesus and He is sufficient. He is now in the glory, but He has sent the Holy Spirit who is 
in us and who leads us. And so all the resources that we need are in the Lord Jesus who is now in the glory. We read about him in Hebrews 2 and 1 and other scriptures. And all the resources are in him. That is where we have to strengthen ourselves, in him. That also means that you don't put your trust in yourself. And so Peter had to learn that lesson and we have to learn that lesson to put our trust in the Lord Jesus and then to surrender to God's plan. God is absolutely in control. So what the Lord says here in John 21:18, the time will come that you will stretch forth your hands and another shall gird thee and bring thee where thou dost not desire. That is a reference to uh, Peter's death. And verse 19 explains that. But that was not going to take place immediately. It would go place, take place when he would be old. Do you see that in verse 18? That's the reason when Peter was in prison in Acts 12, when Herod wanted to kill him, you know, Peter was sleeping. Now imagine, you're on death row. You know, tomorrow morning they will execute me. Are you going to sleep that night? But Peter slept. Why? He knew it's not going to happen. The Lord said, when you will be old, then it will happen. So that's an important point. So he trusted the Lord. And he found his resources in the Lord himself. And he says, now, as I have found my resources in the Lord Jesus, now you need to find your resources in him. In verse 19, to go back to John 21 more uh, one more time in verse 19 it says this signifying and that's a very interesting word signifying means to indicate clearly even through a sign as it were the Lord Jesus had spoken of his coming death in chapter 12 and also in chapter 18 and he signified he made that very clear how he would die he would be lifted up and so that was a reference to the Lord's own death. But here the reference is to Peter's death. The Lord explained in these words in verse 18, and he signified, he indicated, indicated very clearly by what death Peter would glorify God. Uh, earlier Peter had put his trust in himself, and he thought he was better than the other disciples. But now the time would come when he would be really in tune with God, dependent on the master's will and he would allow somebody to take Peter and put him on the cross or put him to death now I said God is absolutely in control and Peter learned to submit to this control and that's a lesson for us today the Lord is absolutely in control that, just, that does not justify man's wickedness that does not justify what man is doing but my point is, God is in absolute control. And that's what Peter, he rested in that. He knew now, God is in control. Acts 12, the time had not come yet. But soon the time would come, and that is what he refers to in Second Peter. This would take place very soon. And he knew that because of the Lord's work, words here in John 21, 18 and 19. But then after, I also want to emphasize this point, that he would glorify God in his death. The Lord Jesus glorified God in his death and now his disciple would also glorify God in his death. Of course there's a tremendous difference between the Lord's death and Peter's death but there is something in common. God would be glorified. And that's amazing how God can be glorified in the death of a believer. It's amazing how God can use that. Death is the enemy the king of terror, we talked about that yesterday a little bit at the conference. And so, how can God use that to glorify God? That shows how God great is. That he can even use the king of terror to be glorified. Now, the king of terror was taken care of by the Lord Jesus on the cross. The Lord Jesus overcame the power of death and of the one who has that power, who has that control. The Lord Jesus in the work on the cross, in his dying, he overcame the one who had the power of death, and in that God was glorified. Now, when Peter would also enter into death, God would be glorified. Not 
he would not die the same way that the Lord Jesus died. Of course not. The Lord Jesus is absolutely unique. But my point is that in Peter's death, God will be glorified. Because he is following the Master. And the Master would glorify God, and now Peter is going to follow the Master. And so he would also glorify God in his death. Um, God is glorified in many different ways. God is glorified in His creation. When you consider the wonders of creation, the vastness of this universe, how everything functions, although the fall of man has, has uh, had a negative impact on it all, yet we see God's glory in nature, in creation, despite all the claims of people that said it just happened. But also, what we have seen in John's Gospel, not only God's glory in creation, we have seen that in John 1, in a particular way, that the Word, through the Word, everything came into being. There we see the great Creator God. And this morning we read in Hebrews 1, 3, that there also we see the glory of the Creator. And even before the Lord Jesus created anything, He was already appointed heir. That shows again this control that God has and that everything is for to His glory and honor. So this point now um, that I'm trying to make is that the Lord Jesus is following, excuse me, that Peter is following the Master. And so while we are here in this scene, we are following the Master. He went through this world, he honored God, and now his disciples may honor God as they follow him. And more about following is now coming in the coming verses. Having said this, he says to him, follow me. See, Peter was going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. Today, you and I are to be followers of the Lord Jesus. That's a tremendous privilege. And that's a theme you can follow through the Gospels. It's also in John's Gospel. But in every Gospel, you can follow this thread. You follow the king in Matthew. Matthew had this call, follow me. And he did. He followed the king. In Mark, you see the call to follow the great teacher. To follow the Lord Jesus as the great servant and to be servants with him. In Luke's gospel, you follow and you learn from him whose glory you find unfolded in, in Luke's gospel. The son of man his human uh, the emphasis on his human nature but in John's gospel you see the Lord Jesus in his greatness as the son of God you see him also as the son of man and what a privilege it is to follow him to go after him and the Lord said in uh, John 12 26 uh, for follow, if you follow me uh, I'll just read that verse John 12 26 it's a key verse to memorize. If anyone serve me, let him follow me. So you want to follow to serve the Lord? First, follow him. And then he says in John twelve twenty six in the middle, Where I am, there also shall be my servant. So that's his promise. And then if anyone serve me, him shall the Father honor. That is at the end, the Father will honor those who follow the Lord Jesus. So, the Lord wants us to follow Him, and then ultimately the Father will honor those who follow the Lord Jesus. And when Peter then has heard these instructions of his own coming death, and then the Lord says, follow me, that will be sufficient. But then Peter turns around. We have seen Peter in the Gospels as one who is a leader. And so, from a natural perspective, you can understand that Peter, well, he thinks also of uh, the other disciples, and especially the one who is there, who is always there, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, in this Gospel, we have seen five times this disciple whom Jesus loved. That is the agape love, and once it is also the friendship love. He's also called the other disciple five times. It's interesting. But this disciple is marked by the fact that he was following. And that's an illustration for you and me today. 
John is not making a big thing of himself. Like Peter had this tendency to make himself great. He's in his love greater than the other disciples. Uh, John had no claims whatsoever. But John, you find reality. You find reality with John. Peter, a nice confession. Lord, if they all forsake you, I will not forsake you. That's a nice confession. But it's a lack of reality. And the Lord pointed that out to Peter. But here with John, you find reality. Not just a claim, but he is doing it. And that's a lesson for me. We often say more than we do. And so the Lord wants us to be like John, just following. And then ultimately the Father will honor those who follow the Lord Jesus. And there is another detail given in verse 20, who also leaned at supper on his breast. Uh, John was very close to the Lord Jesus, and at the supper he was beside the Lord Jesus, and eating together with him from the same uh, bowl. And there he leaned on his breast. So he found a resting place there. He found support. Just looking it up in verse 19. In verse 20. In verse 20. So during supper, Peter had found a resting place there on the Lord's breast. That is, his love sustained. The Lord's love sustained John. There is also a reference in John 13 that he was lying in his bosom. And that's not a contradiction. The two go together. This in place of intimacy gave support to John. And so an application for us in a relationship of intimacy with the Lord Jesus, we will find support. But the bosom speaks of communion. The, we have seen in John 1 that the, the Son is in the bosom of the Father. That is intimate communion. And so that intimate communion was also uh, experienced by John. Now, of course, there is this difference. The communion that the Lord Jesus had as the Son with the Father is absolutely unique. None other can have that communion. But we have been introduced into a relationship that the, the Father is now also our Father. And the Lord Jesus who said, my God is your God. That is the intimacy of the relationship we have. And in that sense, we are also in his bosom. Very close communion. And that's what John experienced, and that's why he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved, because he enjoyed that relationship. And so that's also a privilege that we have to be so close to the Lord, to rest in His love, but also to enjoy this communion, this close communion. And then we understand, because... Peter said, he understood that, you know, he gave a sign to this disciple, you ask him, you ask what's going on. And we, we have seen it in John 13, who is it that delivers thee up? And so that is John. And so now Peter, you can understand, Peter was occupied with this question, well, what's going to happen to this disciple? Lord, what shall this man do? Or just as it says in the Greek, what about this one? And so... What does the Lord said then in verse 22? Jesus says to him, Jesus says to him, If I will. I emphasize that, if I will. It's a matter of the Lord's will that he emphasizes here. If I will that he abide until I come, what is that to you? So in other words, it was none of Peter's business. That was between the Lord and the disciple whom he loved. And so Peter himself had a close relationship with the Lord. And the Lord told him, you're going to die for me when the time has come. But in the meantime, follow thou me. Don't be preoccupied with what will happen to this disciple. You follow me. So that is a reminder to Peter to mind his own business and to really follow the Lord Jesus. And it's an encouragement for us too, to really follow him. And to have this reality that we find in John the real disciple. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower. That's implied in what the Lord Jesus says here. And a disciple is also a servant. Doulos. And it's interesting that John, when, you, when he comes to uh, Revelation, you find John as a servant. Is that not a contradiction? John was a disciple, a learner, who kept following the Lord Jesus, who kept learning from him. 
But then John is also a servant. And that's a lesson for us too. We are also servants. And that is needed. Uh, to be a true servant is needed to be a true disciple, to be a true follower. And so what the Lord says here, if I want him to stay on, if I want him to remain, I'll take care of that. So there's a key word in John's Gospel, if I will that he abide, or if I will that he continue, that he remain. If I will that, then it will happen, even till I come. Now the Lord was not saying here, he will remain until my coming. The Lord is saying, if I want it, then he will remain. But then he also said, you follow me. Now the conclusion was, as we see in verse 23, the conclusion that the disciples made, this word therefore went out among the brethren, that disciple does not die. See, that was a human conclusion. Understandable, but not right. And so that uh, is a warning against human tradition. We have a tendency to go by what someone has said in authority, and we go by that, and we don't go by what the Lord has said. And so the challenge here is to really go by what the Lord really has said, and not be uh, led astray by human thinking or human tradition. The Lord had not said, uh, Jesus did not say to him, he does not die, but if I will that he abide or remain until I come, what is that to thee? But that is also an indication of John's ministry. You see, in a sense, the Lord Jesus wanted John to remain, not in person, but this is an indication that John would remain in ministry. When we study the New Testament, we see all the wonderful things that God has given, there was a decline. You start with Ephesus in Revelation 2. Even there, the very beginning, the Lord said to them, I have against you, you have forsaken your first love. That's the beginning of the end. And at the end, at Laodicea, the Lord stands outside. Now what is the, re what is the remedy? That is John's ministry. John introduces the Lord all the time. John would make us cling to the Lord. He would make us follow the Lord and nothing else and nobody else. And so with John's ministry we have this attachment to the person of the Lord Jesus who is sufficient. If everything fails, the Lord does not fail. If everything falls apart, the Lord cannot fall apart. Uh, uh, pardon me for the expression. And that is what we, fee, we see in John's ministry. He remains. And we cling to him in our weakness. And then we can draw from him what we need even in this very moment. Until he comes. And so John's ministry. I'd like to connect it now with First John. Like, no, First John 20. And then we go to First John. And then one verse in Revelation. In John 20. We have seen at that time when we uh, saw verse 31, that is like the first conclusion of John's Gospel. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. That is wonderful. Uh, I know people who, through reading John's Gospel, they got saved. And that is the purpose, that people may get saved. But then when you connect it with 1 John, so 1 John is really the continuation of this ministry that we were talking about. John abides in his ministry. And in 1 John we see those resources that we have in the Lord Jesus, and these are abiding resources. These are resources that nobody can take away. And in his teaching in 1 John, he explains to us, that what we have received through believing, we also may know it, so that nobody can take it away from us. First, one example in 1 John 5, verse 13. These things have I written. So what we have seen in John 20, 31, 
These are written that you may believe. So what he says here, these things have I written unto you, who believe on the name of the Son of God. Now for what purpose was it written? Yeah, to believe. But then also that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So the purpose is that you have the certainty of what you have believed. So we accepted it through faith and now in addition John's ministry brings us to the certainty so that you have the assurance of this. It's not a myth, it is true. And so this certainty we find all through this epistle that we may know for sure and not be not doubt. And so connect that with verse 20 in First uh, John 5 verse 20 we know. We'll come back to that in, one, in a few moments in John 21 the end of chapter 1 we know. So that is a inward conscious knowledge, it is for sure, there is not pretension. You see that this, the Pharisees said we know, but it was pretension. But here the we know that John says, here in 1 John 5.20 and also in John 21, we know, it's not a knowledge of pretension, it's a knowledge connected with this relationship with the Son of God, with the relationship with the Father, and the relationship we can enjoy together having received eternal life. So I'll just read uh, 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and that we are in Him that is true even in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and the eternal life. So He is the eternal life. But this eternal life we have received, and we have seen it in the course of John's Gospel. And so this is to give us the certainty that what we have, that we really understand, and that we may know the one who is true. Know means uh, enjoyment of a relationship. And so we may know the one who is true, and we are in him. That is this very intimate relationship we talked about earlier, uh, John in the bosom of the Lord Jesus. We are in Him. We have this intimate relationship with Him who is true. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ. You cannot get a closer relationship with God than what we have here. He is the eternal life and He is in us and we are in Him. It's wonderful. And that is then concluded by one more verse, very sobering. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Why? There's always a danger to leave this wonderful relationship, to be impressed by other things that want, that want to take his place. So the danger of idolatry is always there, that something else would fill us instead of the Lord Jesus himself. So that is written also for us. But notice that it says, we know. In 1 John 5.20, we know. It is seven times in 1st John Oidamen. this is what we know consciously seven times we have we know and that is ginosko that's a different ver verb it's the objective knowledge so God gives us the objective knowledge so that we really know that is true and he gives us the inward knowledge the inward conscious knowledge that we really know this is true this is what is of God and we enjoy that relationship now that is Go back to me, uh, with me to John 21. That is the word that John is using in his conclusion. See, when John says in 21, this is the, verse, 40, verse 24, this is the disciple who bears witness concerning these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his witness is true. There you have that, the same we know. And so this is a knowledge that is connected with this intimate relationship that we were talking about. This disciple has testified of these things. And it is really wonderful to have this insight that John had and that he could share with us in verse 24. This is the disciple that testified of these things. He is the witness. There are only two authentic witnesses. Did you know that? There were three witnesses on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Peter, his brother, James, and also John. And James was put to death in Acts 12. Uh, there were only two left. There was John, 
he, write, he has written this book. And Peter, of whom we have spoken, First Peter and Second Peter, this were the two authentic witnesses. And Peter has given his witnesses, his testimony in First and Second Peter. And now John has given his testimony here in John 21, and also in his first epistle that we just uh, read about, and also in Revelation. I want to say one more thing about that in a few moments, Lord willing. So here is this uh, in, intimate knowledge of these things, but is also a testimony. This disciple had this intimate knowledge, is a witness. And that's another key word in John's Gospel. It occurs many, many times in John's writings. I've counted at one time 70 times witness or witnessing or uh, martyr that's connected with this word or uh, compound words connected with this. About 70 times in John's writing, including re uh, Revelation. And so he testifies and confirms what is true, verse 24. There's another thing that is striking in connection with John's ministry. It is absolutely true. There's no question about it, no doubt whatsoever. So the truth is presented, the amen is presented, what is true is presented in his writings, and John is a witness of these things. He confirms these things. And that brings us then to verse 25. There are also many other things which Jesus did. Which, and then he says something very interesting. If they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself could contain the books written. Well, first of all, the world cannot grasp these things anyway. But maybe we can see it also this way. Literally. Uh, the Lord Jesus has done so many things. What is written in the Gospels uh, represents perhaps 70 days in his life. But all the other days, all the other things that are not mentioned in his Gospel, if one by one they would be written in detail, as we have it here in John's Gospel, the world could not contain all the books. And that's why I said earlier, this theme we will study when we will be with the Lord, because this is exhaustless, there is no end. This theme that is connected with his person, we will study these things uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Everything has been revealed. So don't misunderstand me. We are not going to get new revelations. But we will be occupied with this person which, who is so wonderful and so deep and so great that the Holy Spirit will draw our attention to details in the scriptures. And every detail again points us to the greatness of the person that is presented in this gospel. And that's the point I wanted to emphasize. And that is also then connected to his revelation. When John sees the Lord Jesus in Revelation, the Lord had said, you know, if I want him to stay till I come, and in a sense that happened in Revelation 1. Because in Revelation 1, you see that the Lord showed himself, and uh, John was, a, uh, was an exile on the island of Patmos, he was there on the Lord's day, so that's the first day of the week, when the Lord appeared to him. And when he saw the Lord, he felt as dead before him. Because now he sees the Lord in a new way. He had never seen the Lord in this way. The Lord presents himself as the great judge. He knew the Lord Jesus as he has walked on this earth. He knew uh, also that he went to heaven. But... He had not seen the Lord Jesus in this new way, as he will manifest himself in this world as the supreme ruler. In that sense, John remained until I come. In that sense, we have that here in Revelation 1. That was probably uh, towards the end of the first century that the Lord appeared to uh, John here. And so, in that sense, the Lord came to him. That was after the other apostles had already passed away. And then the Lord appeared to John here in chapter 1. And it's interesting that verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto me, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified, they have that word again, by his angel and to his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. It's a wonderful summary of John's ministry. And then, when he sees the Lord Jesus in his greatness, the great I Am, 
who is the God Himself, we see that He turns around, and in verse 12 He turns around, and then He sees, He hears the voice, and He sees the one who spoke. And there He sees the greatness of the judge. In verse 13, 14, 15, 16, there we can count seven great, uh, great points. Uh, you can count 10 points. If you want, you can count 12 points. It is an amazing presentation of the greatness of the Lord Jesus as the great judge. And when he appeared then to John, what did John do? Verse 17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He had never seen the Lord Jesus in this way. And so now the Lord comes to him in this new way, and he says, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he that lives, I was dead, and behold, I, live, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. That's the greatness of the person for in front of whom John fell down. And you know, he did this as a disciple. Go back to verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. But John is writing here, he makes a link now with all the believers who are in this world until the coming of the Lord. And that is a testimony that is in tribulation. It's a testimony connected with the kingdom, with the rights of the king. And it implies patience, endurance. You have to keep going while we wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so John is there, an example for us as a disciple who is living in this world where the Lord Jesus is rejected. And he drew all the resources that he needed from the Lord Jesus. You can see that throughout his gospel, throughout the book of Revelation. And John was therefore privileged to meet the Lord as he will be in his coming again. So in that sense, he remained till I come again. So this is a wonderful uh, summary of the ministry that we have here in John. It really is connected with the coming again of the Lord Jesus, but it is specially connected with the person who will come again. And so we are greatly privileged to have these writings by John, who uh, the writings have been given to stimulate us, to bring us back to first love. Is there anybody can say here, I have not lost that first love. No one can say that. But the Lord Jesus is there to stimulate us and to bring us back to Him so that He is everything to us again. The Lord Jesus presents Himself in John's Gospel, in John's writings, in such an attractive way. Although He is the Supreme Judge, although He is the God of heaven and earth, He is also presenting Himself as this the great lover of our souls, who draws us to himself, and he wants us to be his followers in the same world where he was crucified. The Lord has left us here to be his followers until he comes. In the meantime, we have this ministry that shows the greatness of the one who is coming back soon, and we may follow him, we may serve him, we may, we may represent him in the same world where he was rejected. That's a great privilege. So we close here, and that brings us then to the next topic, uh, the book uh, to the Ephesians, because there we see the Lord Jesus as he is now in heaven. Ephesians shows us what the Lord Jesus is in heaven and how we are connected with him while we are in this scene. So there is also an intimate connection with, with Paul's writings. So I conclude with this. We have seen the connection with Peter. And also in First and Second Peter. We have seen the connection with John's writings. And my suggestion is there is an intimate connection also with Paul. Because Paul speaks of the Lord Jesus, who is there now in heaven. You know, when the disciples were standing there, when they saw the Lord Jesus was lifted up, and then a cloud came and separated him from the disciples. They couldn't see him anymore. He was gone. But when Paul saw the Lord Jesus, he saw what happened at the other side of the cloud. Because the cloud went back to heaven, it's a kind of glory, I suppose, and then Paul saw, or Saul of Tarsus saw, 
what is going on there inside the cloud, inside heaven. He saw the Lord Jesus crowned with glory and honor. And so there is another connection that we really need to uh, pay attention to. Because we have the link with Peter to follow the Lord Jesus. We have the link with John who introduces us into the intimacy of this relationship. And then we have the link with Paul who speaks about the one who is there crowned with glory and honor. And we have 14 epistles written by, by Paul. I don't want to be dogmatic. We don't know who is the writer of the Hebrews. But uh, Peter says who, uh, to those believers he wrote to, As our beloved brother Paul has written to you. Second Peter uh, 3, verse 14, 15, around that. And so we see that we have 14 epistles written by Paul to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ with glory and honor. We have seven epistles written by the others. And together they have laid the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. You will see that in Ephesians 2. They have laid the foundation on which we stand today. How wonderful. The scriptures are so great. They are all connected, interconnected. But the theme is the same. The person of our Lord Jesus. Praise His name. And so if there are some questions or comments, we have some time. Yeah. That's true. But you have to connect this also with Revelation um, 119 and 41. Revelation 119, we see then uh, that the Lord Jesus says in verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen. So that is the vision, the appearance of the Lord in chapter 1. He has seen the glory of the Lord, what you have seen. And then the things which are, and the third point, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now if you connect that with Revelation 4.1, we see the same expression hereafter, after this, or after these things. So that is a connection with chapter 119. After these things I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, chapter 1, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. It said, Come up hither, and I will show you the things which must be hereafter. So the things hereafter speak about prophetic events that are going to take place on this earth when we will be in heaven. John was there in heaven. He saw everything in heaven. He saw those elders. He saw the belief from the Old Testament, the New Testament, raptured from this scene in heaven. And then he describes, he has an insight in what's happening afterwards. Chapter 6 to chapter 18 show this great tribulation that will take place first the after the church is in heaven so the church will not be in heaven at that moment the tribulation that you just r rightly refer to is now in this scene that we are in this world that is tribulation that is affliction but the great tribulation according to prophecy you have to compare with Daniel 7 and Daniel 9 then you will see that that is still future and that future is indicated in, Re in Revelation 4 1 and so on all those events that will take place on this earth what we call this, the week of Daniel the, seven, the 70th week of Daniel 9 that is still future and that is the hereafter so as I said earlier there is no event that we have to wait for until the rapture takes place the rapture can take place any moment when the rapture will take place, we will be ushered into heaven. We will be there around the throne. We will see the Lamb in the throne, Roman, uh, Revelation 5. And after that, all these things will be fulfilled that Revelation speaks about. And the great tribulation that you find also in Daniel referred to, that is still future. But that's not the hope of the church. The hope of the church is that we expect the Lord to come. He is the blessed hope. And so that I wanted to add to your comments. That's my sorry, observation in John 21, where service is brought before us. And there are two things that Peter is um, called upon not to focus on. One in verse 18 and 19. Which chapter was? Which sorry, chapter? John 21. Okay. Verse 18 and 19, not to focus on himself, but on the Lord. And then in verse 20 to 22, not to focus on others, but on the Lord. And both are emphasized by the expression, follow me. The, the challenge, I believe, that uh, 
servants have is looking at each other or looking at themselves. And the Lord will have us in both cases to have him as before. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in that line, in verse 18 and 19, we speak of how people will go to fight in the earth instead. Is there a connection between them? John 13, 36, and 37. Yes. I'm glad you mentioned these verses because I wanted to mention them but then I forgot. In John 13, verse 37, he said, it's, it's written, Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. So that, that's the verse that I was thinking of when I spoke. And then the Lord said, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So that was to show Peter, Peter, you cannot do that in your own strength. And we saw the last time a whole list of details. The Lord prayed for him, the Lord warned him, and even after his resurrection, the Lord sent a message to him, the Lord appeared to him. The Lord is in the business of restoration. And what we have seen the last time in those three verses, in those questions, the Lord restored Peter so that he could be an effective servant of the Lord. And so, yeah, these verses are important to uh, consider. Also for us, because we cannot do that in our own strength. Yeah. When he died, he died in when he when he preached, he, he was in Babylon, the apostle to the circumcision, where most of the Jews were in captivity. It's good to so that you do not get deceived and believe counterfeits. Go on Google it and see where Babylon is. <laughs> but this is very controversial, dear brother, because yeah. We don't want to go into controversy because I believe that Peter was in Rome when, when Paul finished working in Rome he traveled for five years after his uh, release from captivity there in Acts 28 and during that time uh, uh, towards the end of Paul's life Peter was there and then Peter was executed and then soon after Paul was also arrested and brought to Rome and from there he wrote Second Timothy and then Paul also was executed under the reign of Nero. But of course the term Babylon, uh, if you take it literally, then Paul, uh, Peter had gone to the believers there in Babylon. But that is very questionable. So the Gentiles took Peter and Paul. Yeah, that's okay. We leave it with the Lord. We leave it with the Lord. Yeah, one more question. Um, this uh, John 21 took place at the Sea of Tiberius, which is Galilee. Yeah, yeah. Is there a connection? And I'm just saying this because I do my own little study. In um, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul speaks of uh, one of the appearances of the Lord, the said, Lord, in verse 6. After this, he was seen about, about over 500 brethren yeah. at one time. Is there a connection between this, this uh, John 21 and First Corinthians 15? Yeah, yeah. The connection is that both events took place in Galilee. So the event that we have here in 21, chapter 21, where you had the, the catch of the fish, was in Galilee. And so also the appearing of the Lord to the 500 brethren was there in Galilee. And that brings me to a point that I forgot. Uh, I wanted to come back to that. The structure of John's Gospel, I mentioned there's a link with John 2, which took place also in Galilee. But if we go to the end of John 21, there's a connection with the beginning of John 1, where you have the greatness of the Lord Jesus presented. And so what we have, we have several endings in, in John's Gospel, and they correlate to the beginning of John's Gospel. It's like a, a cyclist. And so, a cycle. And so, this is amazing, the connection between the very end and the very beginning. And then, there's a connection between chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 21. So, there is 
like two circles. Yeah. It's very interesting that the connection is in connection with Galilee, because Galilee was rejected by the Jewish leadership, and Galilee was where the Lord Jesus was honored by the people in general, and so it was from Galilee that he departed, and that he also showed himself before uh, he went back to heaven. But he went back to heaven from the Mount of Olives. So he went back from Galilee to Jerusalem. You speak at this time with the millennial aspect, but I know that's a different subject, which is also included in yeah. John about 21 there. Yeah. Millennial setting. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So may the Lord bless his words and study.